So is it QA so will you ask the first question or should I ask myself? <laughs> okay, so Jenny, how did you get involved with this project? It's weird that you don't know. <laughs> These guys have heard this story before, but actually this is not the typical answer, but I was walking through a park in Brooklyn and um, the movie Obvious Child had just come out, it was 2014, and this woman here, Rebecca, was a stranger to me, but she walked by me and gave me a little silent round of applause because I guess she had just seen the film and I was on the phone with my mom and I couldn't get off the phone. And uh, so I blew her a kiss and she tweeted at me asking if I would ever read a galley copy of her upcoming novel, her debut novel called The Sunlit Night. And I said, yes, I sure, send it to my house. And sorry, I couldn't get off the phone, I was talking to my mom. And um, she sent the book to my house and I read it um, in an in instant. <laughs> it was so beautiful and I could not get enough of it. And then afterwards just felt like so, incredibly lucky that I had crossed paths with this total stranger. And so we started to, I asked her a lot of questions, like who, who are you and why did you go to Norway? And how do you write so lyrically and write in a way that is so poetic? And uh, it just feels like I'm sort of reading a painting. This is so beautiful. And we became friends. And then when the book was optioned by Michael, um, they asked me if I would be in the film. And I said that I would like to, if they would also let me produce it with them, and um, that was about four years ago. We've become very, very close friends, um, started as strangers in the park, and now we're here in Utah. So how long did it take to paint the whole art house, the barn? So we actually did shoot in Norway, we did shoot in Lofoten, like in the really far, far, far north, and there really was a barn, basically. Uh, and we had like a Norwegian artist who usually does like really gigantic murals. He kind of like came up with a design for it basically. And uh, Jenny executed most of it. No. <laughs> I painted some though, I did. David made me. <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah. that's method acting. Yep. And we shot kind of like in order of, 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 of the strip. That means like in the beginning, like the first scenes when she's she, or a character sees it for the first time, there's almost nothing painted. And like then every time we were not shooting there, the Norwegian artist was, would run in with like two other people and start painting. And like we would go in again. And the last scene, finally, the whole thing was ready. So it basically took as long as we were shooting there, like 25 days maybe. What are we doing with this modern house? Uh, well, I mean, it is still still, still painted. And the, it was a very nice young Norwegian woman who owns a farm there, and she owned that barn, and she like took out all her stuff, like equipment and, and tools, whatever, uh, for us to shoot there. But now all those tools are back in, and she has now a very colorful tool shed. <laughs> No, it's here. I mean, I feel like it's here. Did I understand what the significance of red, basically? I do. I mean, you do film, you do. Uh, we work with dialogue and extra so, but like it's good, in my opinion, to add other levels uh, to to that, basically, other layers. And one is, of course, always working kind of with, with colors. And it was one possibility also because in the end she's no longer wearing red to show a kind of development in that, like to show also how she matured because in the end she's in the more serious dark blue tones basically. And of course red is a warm, energetic color just like this, this character basically and it's like symbolizing that in a way. Thank you very much. Uh, so she wanted to know what the color, the significance of the color yellow, and she said she enjoyed the color of work in the film. So, thanks for that. And, yep. uh, the yep. color yellow. I'll pass that question on to Rebecca, maybe. Um, there is a Norwegian painter named Alf Salo who painted entirely in the color yellow, um, and he passed away uh, while I was writing the book. And the book is actually dedicated to his memory. So I tried to use as much yellow as I could in the book, although he never painted a barn himself. But I think he would have really liked our barn and our Norwegian.
our region, Pedro, the, the Pedro who really did, Pedro Barnard said, consulted a lot of Valve's work um, to, to draw up the color scheme. So I was really happy at that continuity. And of course, for for the character, of course, I mean, art is about choosing and about like reducing stuff, basically not using all the colors. And and I mean, it's like Neil's in the film. He shows that like only with one color it's possible to do like an entire artwork, an entire building. I wound up in the Arctic of Norway um, sort of arbitrarily. I, I got it into my head to go as far north on the planet as I could, and when you do that one place you can wind up is on this archipelago of islands in the Norwegian sea called Lofoten. Um, and I set out there to write a book of poems about their two extreme seasons, 24 hours of darkness and 24 hours of light. Um, but being there entirely alone on an island in the Norwegian sea, I found myself with a great deal of free time. So I wrote this novel because poems are short and novels are so long. and. Uh, this allowed me to really dig into the landscape that I couldn't entirely understand. I, I didn't yet speak the language and I knew no one, and writing about it was really the only way for me to inhabit it. Um, so that's where it started, and from there it really progressed along fictional lines. I didn't have the luxury of a love interest. There was no real life Yasha. I was utterly, painfully single. Um, <laughs> And uh, there was no barn. Uh, the barn was my novel. That was the big hulking piece of work that I was working on. Um, so it really allowed me to create a world within a, a real landscape. And um, it was incredible to go back to that landscape with this team many years later. I mean, this marks a decade since I moved there. So um, it's been an incredible, complete journey. Well, in, uh, it was like, a little bit different for, for different roles. In the case of, of Jenny, she was on board like really from the beginning on, and like Rebecca saw her in this this role. And in other cases, we had like a regular audition process with actors coming in, and you kind of like try to come up with things in the audition uh, where you look for what you want to see later on uh, when you're filming, and you try to like set up scenes or whatever to try to find it there and to be able to see that in the, in the casting. So, so we did that. And I, I'm, as myself, very thrilled and very happy with this cast we got together uh, here. And then of course, every actor and actress has a little way of preparing, of course, and from my side I tried to shoot in a way that they were had the chance to uh, be in the location and maybe also like uh, get a little bit of experience of what their character is doing. So, which brings me to Alex and his baking in preparation for this role. Can you maybe tell us a little bit what's the most important part about making bread? <laughs> it's all of the rest like, um, and repetition. <laughs> no, indeed, I, 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 again, I, I forced another actor to do something, I forced Alex to come at like 2 o'clock at night to Brooklyn and work at a bakery, basically. There was like a bakery, they worked at night, of course, to have everything ready by morning, and he, he was there and really had to just like work there and like, uh, like make dough and make like bread and make all kind of things, basically. You didn't force me. I mean, I, 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 I really enjoyed it actually, and uh, and it was um, it helped me get into uh, the character's physicality a lot as well, um, and yeah, it was just fun also to learn how uh, how many years it, it would take someone to be actually that good um, at making bread, uh, which is many many years. That's also the nice thing about filming, that you actually have the chance to go into these kind of places, basically. That we were really there in the middle of, of, of Brooklyn, and we were suddenly there with these two guys who didn't know like what, what, what's happening to them, like because suddenly we came there and like, watched and wanted to know everything and wanted to do everything, and they 
I've been doing this like for maybe 20, 30 years, basically. Like, like every night, doing the same things, basically, the same head movements. And they were very generous to show us everything and, and to teach us, basically. But that's like the privilege as a filmmaker that you all often get to go into these microcosms and discover stuff. Uh, it was actually the second time I've worked with Gillian Anderson. The first time she played a mother figure, and this time she played my mother. Um, so, uh, just like the last time, truly wonderful. She's an amazing actress, um, and she's a very generous and intelligent and wonderful person, uh, and added a lot to the set. And yeah, it was, it's a thrill to act opposite someone that incredible. Yeah. As a writer, the first scene that I, I wrote in the book truly 10 years ago is the funeral scene. Um, the book actually started with Yasha. There was no Francis character in the first draft of The Sunlit Night. It was all about Yasha and his father traveling north. Um, and the first scene that I imagined was Vasily's funeral um, at the top of the world. So to film that, we. <laughs> The night that we filmed the funeral scene was one of the only clear skied nights that we had over the course of our six weeks in the Arctic. We had incredibly stormy weather, and we actually rearranged our entire shooting schedule so that we could shoot the funeral scene in good weather. And to be able to have that scene on camera um, under the colors of that clear sky is incredibly rewarding and meaningful to me. There's a million ways to be right, um, and I, I, but I do think I, I want to make sure that um, when Becky writes something that I understand what she's saying. Um, and I, I, I think one of the things that was most exciting for me was to play someone who was very um, unprotected and not because she was trying to be super strong, but because that is essentially the way that Frances dwells in the world, is that she's gentle and she is inherently sweet and unprotected, but she's not a fool. Um, but uh, so that said, I, I wanted to be that without being a victim. And the scene where Nils comes up the scaffolding and is, you know, he's mostly just stressed out that, that they're just in the, the middle of the work and he wants reassurance that it will be done and he has sort of extra energy and doesn't mean to abuse her, but he does because I think when people don't connect properly but one person really, really needs something, there's the potential for inadvertent abuse. And I, I think in that moment, to make sure that Francis was angry, but that I wasn't just hitting sort of a blank aggression button, um, which might make him into like a sexual predator or, you know, um, generalize him and try to keep it specific. And that, that balance was hard in that scene, but <coughs> luckily Frijoff, um, who played Nils, was just such a wonderful performer and came up that scaffolding in a scary way that honestly scared the shit out of me. Um, yeah, there's not, yeah, I'm like genuinely scared in those scenes, but, um, but he also came up as a human. And so I think Francis is upset, but she also feels concerned for him. And that duality is something I, I tried to hold. There are all parts of the natural world that are in some ways the most animated elements of the natural world and the ones that are most dynamic to interact with. Um, and it was a pleasure to be able to bring those elements of the landscape into active life on the screen, which is something a writer rarely gets to see. Um, I've admired the sheep and goats of Liverton for years, and I never in a million years dreamed that Jenny would be in a bed with one. <laughs> so um, it's you just it was a wonderful activation <laughs> of something that it can very easily just lie in the background. Um, well, first of all, uh, just as background information, there really is this Viking Museum up there in the north, and they actually have this kind of movie there, basically. <laughs> this being Norway, they have lots of wilderness, lots of empty space, but also lots of money. So that's why they put up like this huge uh, 
uh, museum there. Isn't that so rude? <laughs> and like, they spent like like double our budget on their 10-minute uh, Viking film there. So <laughs> when we went there um, and, and saw that, we, and it was clear that we needed to do this also for our film, just to like, replicate the real reality of, of Norway and how they present their culture. <laughs> and we had like one day for that. And you are absolutely right, it was very fun to do that. Uh, it was like, really fun to actually have like men and swords and fighting and, and, and so and all of that and like one small fog machine. It was really a fun thing and I think it was more or less like the middle of the shooting there. And the going to the ocean probably was in the end because we didn't know if Jenny would come back, so <laughs> that's the last thing. Or am I misremembering that? No, I, re I remember that, yeah, it being, I mean, it was, it was like, I, I would say it was like three quarters through, maybe? Yeah, like we were there for five weeks, I feel like it was week like three and a half, but, but maybe not, and uh, I was really dreading it, but also wanted to get it over with, I sort of was afraid I was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> Just because it's so cold, um, and it truly is unbelievably cold. Yeah. That's, we have to come to the next. <laughs>